Good evening everyone. This is Dr. Ramya from Medicos community. Am I visible and audible to all the students? Please give me a thumbs up. Yes, okay. So before I start today's session, that is 15 questions will be discussed today and 10 questions will be discussed on 18th Feb, 8.45 p.m. Let me introduce the Medicos community to you. So, Medicos community is an e-learning platform based on the next exam. National Board of Examination has already uh, declared that there will be national exit test which is supposed to happen in 2024. So, Medicos community provides test bank, Q bank and comprehensive e-notes by expert faculties above all Interactive classes will be taken online so that there will be active learning. So without much ado, go to medicoscommunity.com and book your slots. The early bird offer is live in the website which is only for the first 3000 slots. So coming to today's session, we will be discussing 15 questions today and again the other 10 questions will be discussed on 18 February 8.45 as I have already said. So uh, I would like the students to answer the questions in the chat box so that it will be an interactive session. Coming to the first and the easiest question. All the questions are clinical based and some of them are one liners just like as in NEET PG exam. So, on Friday, 8th November 1895, W.C. Ranjan was reproducing earlier work using low output Leonard tubes, whereby the fluorescence was visible on the screen coated with barium platinocyanide. What were those rays? So, this is a pretty easy question. The answer is X rays. He put the name as X rays because the source of the rays was unknown and he just named it X as a variable. So he is W.C. Ranjan. He is the father of radiology. And as you can see, he did this discovery on 8th November. That is the International Day of Radiology. And he received a Nobel Prize for the same in the year 1901. So all of the three things in the slide are important. So next coming to the production of x-rays, a little bit about production of x-rays. So the source of the x-rays is the x-ray tube. The basic components of the x-ray tube are the cathode, anode, and the glass envelope which is covering it with vacuum in it. The reason for having vacuum, I will be explaining you in a short while. So, first coming to the cathode, it is made up of tungsten filament. Atomic number is 74. And this is the filament, tungsten filament, whose, which atomic number is 74. This is the focusing cup. This is the negative end of the X-ray tube and this is the positive end. The anode is the positive end and it is made up of tungsten and rhenium alloy. The anodes are two types. They can be stationary or rotatory. What we use in our day-to-day -day life is a rotatory anode. The reason for this also I will be discussing in a short while. And stationary anodes are absolute now but we still use them in portable X-rays as well as old mammography and dental x-rays. So, why are we using a rotatory anode? The electro When energy is provided, that is the tube voltage is given from the cathode to anode, the energy travels and it is given to the anode at the level of filament, there is a process called as thermionic emission. Because of the energy, the electrons are pinched out of this filament and come and lie just above the filament and they form a space charge around it. 
when further energy is given to the tube these electrons travel in straight paths and hit directly on the target that is the tungsten and rhenium alloy anode and x rays are produced but not everything not all the energy which we are providing is going to form as x rays only 1% of it is going to form x rays and rest of the 99% is going to be a heat so this heat needs to be dissipated otherwise it will cause harm to the anode tube and it will cause a uh, much ruckus and this entire thing will not happen so for that the heat should be dissipated outside it is dissipated by oil and as well as through natural radiation the that is the reason why it is a rotating anode if it is rotating anode it is easy for the heat to dissipate and the focal spot can be adjusted as required this entire uh, thing is in the vacuum because the electrons will travel in straight lines and less energy is consumed that way and there will be no friction because there is no air the entire glass envelope is put in a lead casing so that there will not be any leakage of radiation but it is not the ideal phenomena this is all theory there will always be leakage that is why we use filters to stop those uh, leakage radiation and not to harm the staff and patient and whatever is the required dose only that much will be given so the next important point here is the x ray tube is inside what all machines obviously it is inside the x ray tube x rays and ct these both will use the x rays whereas the other modalities which i'll be discussing in the coming lecture will be using different types of ionizing and non ionizing uh, uh, radiation um, so coming to the next part next question what is the sign in the image and the condition so when we are approaching the image based questions first what we have to do is look at the anatomy first identify the parts and so then you will get an idea by excluding the options and it will be easy for you in the exam this is the heart and this is the descending aorta this is esophagus and this is the lungs this is the right lung and this is the left lung here we are able to see that about outside the lung there is a collection it can be an emphyma or exudative effusion which is placed between the visceral and pleural layers of the lung that is that means spinnaker sail sign thymus in pneumo mediastinum it is not thymus bulging fissure sign klebsiella pneumonia no klebsiella pneumonia will discuss further laftitial sign left upper lobe collapse and split pleura sign emphyma so we are able to see here the visceral and parietal pleura there is an en enclosure of emphyma within it this is the split pleura sign which we see in emphyma coming to the other options also so that we'll be discussing more than one topic for one question uh, let me show you the images for the others so this is the neonit x ray which is showing a sail sign which is normal thymus and we should not be confusing it with the pathology this is a normal neonatal x ray which is showing spinnaker sail sign of the normal thymus here in the adult frontal chest x ray we are seeing a radio opacity in the right upper zone that is the consolidation which is causing the pressure effect on the adjacent fissure so this is klebsiella pneumoniae showing the bulging fissure sign although this is classical for klebsiella pneumoniae it can also occur in any space occupying uh, lesion but this is classical for uh, klebsiella
next coming to uh, okay uh, here i would like to say about all the uh, x rays findings of a normal chest and then we'll go on to the pathology so for any chest x ray the first thing you have to see is penetration see this is the normal air outside and this is the air inside so it is almost equal this is an overexposed film and should not be confused with any pathology the next thing is you are supposed to look for the spinous process and the medial end of clavicle if they are equidistant there is no rotation in this case there is no rotation if there is rotation we need to exclude some pathologies and next after seeing this this is the trachea tracheal shadow which we are able to see here this is the tracheal shadow and it is in the center that means there is no mediastinal shift to the right or left next coming to the bony pathology we are supposed to look at the clavicles scapula and all the ribs if there are any fractures and then coming to the heart borders the right heart border is formed by the svc right atrium and just minimally by the ivc whereas the left heart border is formed by the aortic knuckle pulmonary bay left atrium and the left ventricle so it looks like the heart border is fine here but there is a opacity just beyond this is the aortic knuckle and we are able to see a lucent line here this is actually the normal left lower lobe this is the normal left lower lobe which is which is on the arch of aorta and then this is the wheel like opacity seen on the left upper zone this is the consolidation of left upper lobe which is calling causing the left tracheal sign so what are the other so what are the other uh, signs for other lung lesion uh, lung consolidations let us discuss in brief for the right upper zone if um, if there is a consolidation in the right upper zone there is a golden s sign especially if it is associated with the bronchogenic carcinoma and there will be obscuration in the form of a right upper in the form of golden s sign as the fissure is pulled up upwards if there is a right middle zone consolidation the middle part of the heart border will be obscured and there will be a wheel like opacity here this is for the right middle lobe and if it is a right lower lobe consolidation the lower part of the uh, diaphragm will be obscured that is siloted and it is the same for the left heart border uh, left uh, lower lung also left hemi diaphragm will be obscured or siloted we have already seen about the left upper lobe collapse and for the left lower lobe collapse the left heart border will be obscured so in all of these conditions the trachea will still remain in the center so because these are, these are all are consolidations what if it is a pleural effusion or a fibrosis we'll discuss those two points which are very important the most uh, important thing to look for in pleural effusion is the cardiophrenic angle there will be blunting of the cardiophrenic angle and there will be a meniscus sign this is the sorry costophrenic angle i'm very sorry the costophrenic angle there will be blunting and there will be a meniscus sign here seen so this is the sign for pleural effusion and uh, what if it is a massive pleural effusion will there be mediastinal shift yes there will be mediastinal shift but to the opposite side so that is the important pa part here that means the trachea will be deviated to the opposite side rather of the lesion the, of the pleural effusion if it is fibrosis then what will happen it is fibrotic that means it will the uh, on the side of the lesion there will be pulling 
so the trachea will be deviated towards the side of the lesion and in the pleural effusion it will be away from the side of lesion okay these are the important points the minimum bare minimum we need to know in while reading an x-ray coming to the next question lead pipe colon is seen in which condition a ulcerative colitis b crohn's disease c tuberculosis d irritable bowel disease so let's first let's read the x-ray these are the spinous process and these are the vertebral bodies these are the lower ribs and this is the liver shadow and this is the iliac bone and hip joint and this is the sacrum okay so the elephant this is the psoas shadows now coming to the lesion we are able to see small bubble uh, which is which has lost all of its hostrations and there is complete there is complete lot loss of hostrations and it is very characterless what is it looking like it is looking like a lead pipe this is characteristic for ulcerative colitis let's go in detail about ulcerative colitis and crohn's disease then we'll come back to the other options so first ulcerative colitis will definitely involve the rectum crohn's disease terminal ileum will definitely be involved symptoms for ulcerative colitis are bloody diarrhea for crohn's disease crampy abdominal pain thickness of inflammation that is these are the layers of the bowel mucosa submucosa muscularis propria and adventitia okay only the mucosa and submucosa are involved in ulcerative colitis whereas there is transmural inf inf inflammation that is from the mucosa to the adventitia everything is involved there is transmural in inflammation in crohn's disease the complications for ulcerative colitis are hemorrhage and toxic megacolon whereas for crohn's is fistula abscess obstruction both of these conditions are involved uh, associated with primary sclerosing cholangitis erythema nodosum and there are a few overlapping features but the characteristic radiological features help them in distinguishing both of them that is the distribution is continuous in ulcerative colitis whereas it is discontinuous in crohn's that is if this is the bowel some part of the it is involved complete uh, wall is involved and there is a skip lesion in between and then again the bowel is involved again so based on this there are different treatments 5 amino salicylic acid sulfasalazine and azathioprine is given for ulcerative colitis whereas for crohn's disease it is more of steroids hydrocortisone budenosone prednisone uh, and the other important uh, lab reporting which can be given in your question also is that the ulcerative colitis c reactive protein is normal for crohn's disease it is elevated okay uh, and tox coming to toxic megacolon how will you identify toxic megacolon it is greater than 6 cm the bowel will be involved coming uh, let me take this opportunity to tell you about the 369 rule also so if the small bowel is enlarged for more than 3 cm and if the large bowel is enlarged for more than 3 6 cm and if the cecum is enlarged for more than 9 cm we can call it as toxic megacolon also the 6 is important in radiology if more than 6 mm dilatation is there for appendix then we name it as appendicitis just going out of the topic but it is essential for you to know so next coming to the next question identify the condition a scurvy rickets lead poisoning and fluorosis i'm sorry i haven't ruled out the other options okay now coming to tuberculosis ileocecal valve is definitely involved and there will also be cecal wall thickening which is classical and there obviously there will be lymph nodes which are conglomerate necrotic 
and uh, matted. Uh, for irritable bowel disease, there will be history of alternating constipation and diarrhea. So, the other options are removed. Next, coming to the fourth question, identify the condition. Scurvy, rickets, lead poisoning and fluorosis. So, first let's start reading the x-ray. This is a neonatal x-ray. We, we are able to see the ossification centers here. And there is metaphyseal widening, there is metaphyseal cupping and there is fraying. What are all these terms? This is classical for rickets and uh, there is deficient mineralization in the osteoid matrix. That is why there is metaphyseal widening. That is the growth plate is enlarged. That is why we are able to see the splaying. Splaying is metaphyseal widening and there is a concavity in the metaphysis as I have already explained. This is the cupping feature and there are indistinct margins of the metaphysis. This is fraying. So all these features are characteristic for rickets. The other features which are characteristic for rickets in chest x-ray we will be able to see the rachitic rosary. And uh, a simple way to remember all the things for rickets is through a mnemonic reaction of periosteum, indistinct margins as we have already said in fraying, strabeculations, knees are involved wrists are involved, there will be bowing at knees, the wrists which we have already discussed and rachitic rosary will be there in the ribs and epiphyseal plates are widened. This is the first and important finding, epiphyseal widening and there is tremendous metaphysis. That is, there is cupping, splaying and the metaphysis is enlarged. In per metaphysis, so, all the features are covered in this mnemonic for rickets. Next, coming to the other options, scurvy. So, what is scurvy? It is due to vitamin C deficiency and there will be bleeding tendency to the patient. This is the subperiosteal hemorrhage which is seen. This is the periosteum which is elevated. The scorbutic zone which is, the, it is nothing but the radiolucent area just behind the zone of provisional calcification. The zone of provisional calcification is dense and it is the white line of Frankel. There is a ring epiphysis called as Wimberger ring. This is also seen in, Wimberger ring is also seen in congenital syphilis. And uh, this is the Pelkian spur. The Pelkian spur, Wimberger ring, dense zone of provisional calcification and scorbutic zone and superiorosteal hemorrhages. All of these in total are classical for scurvy. Whereas only Wimberger ring sign is a differential. We can put it as congenital syphilis. This is also seen in congenital syphilis. Coming to this x-ray, we are able to see there are dense radio-opaque bands at the metaphysis. This is lead poisoning. And the differential for this condition is healing rickets. As we have seen, the healing rickets after giving vitamin D, they can also show dense metaphyseal bands. There are other conditions also, leukemia, there will be small, small, thin, thin lines of dense metaphyseal bands which are not as dense as this. These are very dense. There are only small, thin lines at the metaphysis. It is characteristic for leukemia. Coming to the other option, um, here we are able to see the interosseous membrane calcification between the radius and ulna. This is characteristic for fluorosis. Okay, 
Let's go ahead with the next question. What is the sign and condition? So, first we are supposed to see what is here, at which level we are. This is the frontal lobes. And this is the lateral ventricle. And these are the lateral ventricles. This is the frontal horn of lateral ventricle. And this is the temporal horn of lateral ventricle. So, this is the line for the cerebrum which is so looking as a mountain so the answer here is mount fuji sign which is seen in tension pneumocephalus so what happens is the frontal veins pull up the uh, cerebrum and they hold it up like this and because there is air here see the density h u here and the dense h u here is same that is air so, coming to the CTHUs, let me give you a small idea about it. Air is minus 1000. The opposite of it, that is the bone, is plus 1000. Water, that is, we are able to see, that is the CSF space or anything, that will be around the HU of 0. Gray matter will be 45 to 55. And uh, white matter will be also at the uh, 55 to 65. Blood will be of the HU 40 to 60. Okay. Uh, coming to the other options, let me show you images so that you'll remember better. So, this is a neonatal uh, axial CT where the sulci and gyri are absent. As we have seen in the previous uh, image, the, there should be normal sulci and gyri here. But there is no sulci and gyri. It is all smooth and in the shape of 8. Listen carefully. It is a congenital brain anomaly. And we are able to even see the la dilated lateral ventricles. This is the cerebellar peduncle. And this is a superior cerebellar peduncle which is elongated. The cerebellar vermis is hypoplastic and there is deep inter interpeduncular fossa. This molar tooth sign, it is characteristic for Jobert syndrome. The other important feature for Jobert syndrome is bat wing appearance of fourth ventricle. So, this is lysencephaly. This is Jobert syndrome. Next, uh, popcorn calcification is seen in pulmonary hematoma, pulmonary hemorrhage, pulmonary teratoma, pulmonary embolism. So, students, you might be confident when you are not asked in the exam. But when you are asked in the exam with the exam tension and everything, you might get confused. So, another trick to solve uh, for solving the MCQs is just look at the question, try to form an answer and then look at the options. So, that is a better way to solve the MCQs. Okay. So, pulmonary hematoma is the answer. Popcorn calcifications. It itself says there are calcifications hematoma is abnormal bone, uh, abnormal uh, tissue in normal place. So, this is the abnormal tissue here. We are able to see at the uh, iotopulmonary window. There is a radio opacity. On axial CT section, we are able to see there are calcifications. That is almost, see it is of the bone. So, it is calcification and also there is a soft tissue opacity surrounding it which is almost of fat density. So, hematomas are classically, they have fat in them and there will be calcifications. The calcification is characteristically popcorn. So, let us also name the other uh, anatomical structures here. This is the arch of iota and this is the trachea. This is the thoracic vertebra with the uh, foramen through which the spinal cord goes. This is the spinous process. These are the ribs and this is the scapula. This is pectoralis major muscle and pectoralis minor muscle and this is the subcutaneous fat. This is the sternum. 
okay and this is the anterior junctional line to which the um, either of the mediastinum is divided coming to the next question hebbedens nodes are found in pip joints in osteoarthritis dip joints in osteoarthritis pip joints in osteoarthritis and dip joints in rheumatoid arthritis so this is the most uh, important topic let me go in detail and then we'll come back to the questions so hebbedens nodes the best way to remember this is to have a mnemonic in the x X-ray. Burkhardt's nodes are seen at the proximal interphalangeal joints. That is, this are the Burkhardt's nodes, and these are the Hebbedens nodules. Next, coming to whether if it is osteoarthritis or rheumatoid arthritis. Osteoarthritis generally involves the radial aspect of the carpal bones. And proximal proximal interphalangeal joints and distal interphalangeal joints, as well as the thumb interphalangeal joint. Okay, rheumatoid arthritis involves the ulnar aspect of the carpals and only the proximal interphalangeal joints and the metacarpophalangeal joints of all the fingers metacarpophalangeal joints and the proximal interphalangeal joints these are the proximal this is the metacarpophalangeal these are the distal interphalangeal joints proximal interphalangeal joints the metacarpophalangeal joints are not involved in osteoarthritis So, just to be giving you a uh, picture about rheumatoid arthritis, there will always be bone erosions, decrease in joint space, and there can also be bone displacement in rheumatoid arthritis. Whereas in osteoarthritis, there will only be osteophytes, decrease in bone space, there will be um, more of uh, destruction. So, coming to the uh, habitus nodes are found in H. So, DIP joints in osteoarthritis or rheumatoid arthritis. They are found in rheumatoid arthritis. Um, next, coming to the other option, which is gout, there will be uh, soft tof tissue tophi, which are characteristic for gout, and there will be sclerotic overhanging edges, especially in the thumb. And the most uh, important point about gout is it will be involving the great toe. It will be involving the great toe first and there will be random uh, joints which will have erosions and punched out lesions and uh, there will be preserved joint space. Whereas in rheumatoid and osteoarthritis there is reduced joint space. Coming to the next question, what is the most likely diagnosis? So, as usual, let us start with uh, labeling everything. These are the orbits which are not completely covered in this section. The, this is the FAX which is deviating and uh, the right ventricle is also compressed whereas the left ventricle is normal. So, from the midline, it is definitely more than 5 mm. So, there is mediastinal shift here and there is mass effect. Why? We are able to see there is a hyperdense area which is banana shape and is of the HU almost of 60, 40 to 60. That means it is bled. So, we are able to say that there is bled here. Let us see how we uh, differentiate extradural or epidural hematoma, subdural hematoma, subarachnoid hemorrhage and skewora. So, 
diagrammatic representation of all the things so first we will see our answer that is subdural hematoma it is banana shaped as you can see or by concave or convex this is due to venous blood and it is due to bridging veins which are torn so this is the venous blood so it it will be attached to the dura of the skull and cannot cross the fox or tentorium but it can cross the sutures it will cross the sutures but it cannot cross the fox or tentorium that means it will not it cannot cross the midline whereas epidural hematoma it is due to the arterial blood and it is generally because of the skull fracture and generally meningeal artery middle meningeal artery is torn and the dura is pushed away by the hematoma forming a biconvex shape whereas this is concave or convex this is biconvex shape so this is epidural hematoma it will cross the cross the sutures but cannot cross the so it is because of the skull fracture and it cannot cross midline okay uh, let me discuss about the uh, other entity also so this is the these are the layers from inside to outside via arachnoid and dura the subarachnoid space this is the subarachnoid space if it is filled with uh blood then there is subarachnoid hemorrhage which is a life threatening condition and we are supposed to report it as soon as possible and the most common cause for subarachnoid hemorrhage is traumatic if it is non traumatic and it, it can be due to aneurysm rupture and depending upon where the subarachnoid uh, which space is filled with blood we will be able to say uh, where the aneurysm is so if the aca is involved the anterior interhemispheric fissure will show blood if pcom is involved there will be blood in the interpeduncular cisterns and most important if mca is involved there will be blood in the sylvian fissure we will discuss all of it in the next slide again so this is a healthy brain uh, these are the ventricles and this is the uh, sylvian fissure here this is the third ventricle and this is the lateral ventricle here we are able to see there is a hyperdense area in the shape of a banana this is sdh here we are able to see there is a hyperdense area which is in the form of bi biconvex it is edh here there is another entity which is intraparenchymal hemorrhage this is mostly seen in hypertensive patients most commonly the intraparenchymal hemorrhage is at the putamen which is classical for hypertensive bleed here the bleed is extending into the ventricles this is the ventricle and there is hyperdense area within the ventricle it is interventricular hemorrhage and this is subarachnoid hemorrhage which is This, which is seen here in the interpeduncular region. Coming to the next question, what is the most likely diagnosis? A lymphoma, laryngeal cyst, ranula, thyroid cyst. So, how does lymphoma look in the CT? It will look hyper dense because it is densely with. filled with compacted cell cells it always is hyperdense that means it is higher attenuation whereas what we are able to see here this is a 
fluid like that means it is a cyst so what are the other options we have here laryngeal cyst ranular thyroid cyst so next thing what we'll do is this is the mandibular bone right so we are we are not at the level of thyroid we are not at the level of larynx this is epiglottis and this is we are at the level of larynx but it is not abutting or causing any impression on this side this is the mylohyoid muscle which is the where is the mylohyoid muscle on this side there is no mylohyoid muscle on this side because it is being abutted by the ranula okay so let's see about the other ones also first let me say this is the epiglottis and this is the larynx and here we are able to see a cyst like structure in the larynx this is the hyoid bone and this is the common carotid external carotid and internal jugular veins this is the cervical vertebra through which the spinal cord is going in the foramen so this is a laryngeal cyst here we are able to see there is hyperdense structure here because thyroid has iodine in it it is of more attenuation when we are seeing on the ct okay these are contrast enhanced uh, images this is the th thyroid which is showing a radio loose uh, hypodense structure within it this is an example of thyroid cyst so whenever you are reading any other uh, subject also when you try to compare it with the radiological anatomy and then the visual memory is stays longer time and it will be easy for you to remember more for the long term 10th question identify the lesion so first we let us see where the lesion is um then we will be able to think about what are the common problems that occur in that region medicine is all about correlating stuff so make sure you correlate all the subjects and then you will have a easy and smooth preparation so this is the sacrum and these are the iliac blades and there is a hyper intensity at the sacroiliac joint just uh, this side and to that side this is characteristic for insufficiency fracture small snorts is mostly seen in the vertebra and they are dark in all the sequences and osteoporotic colla collapse mostly occurs in the weight bearing areas metastatic deposits will generally be more multiple than like this the characteristic for insufficiency fractures is a nuclear scan so as we have discussed x rays we are using in ct and x ray the other more energy that is gamma rays are used in nuclear medicine that means there is a gamma camera we will inject the radio nucleotide into the patient in the case of bone scan we give technetium 99 m mdp methylene diphosphate through iv and then when the tracer reaches the particular area there will be uptick if there is a lesion and that will be captured through a gamma camera and it will be displayed on the monitor for us so this is a nuclear medicine image bone scan uh, done after technetium 99 mdp we are able to see there is a h shaped uh, uptick in the sacrum and the iliac plates this is the honda sign classical for sacral insufficiency fractures as we have seen there is a subtle increase in the sclerosis in vertical orientation in the in the ct here this is the sclerotic part 
So the other modalities uh, which we uh, use in radiology are ultrasound. With these are sound waves. Whereas in MRI, we use non-ionizing radiation. Microwaves and radio waves are used. Why am I stressing is because in X-ray and CT, as we have already seen, the bone is very well visualized. So whenever there is a question of what is the best investigation, think about what is the structure that we are wanting to see there. What is the pathology that is behind? If it is bone, then we have to go for CT or X-ray. If it is soft tissue, for soft tissue delineation and characterization, MRI is ab absolutely the best modality and for ultrasound it is the easiest and cheap way to look for in trauma cases, to look for free fluid and most of the investigations if we are able to uh, confirm in ultrasound it is better so as to not to go for any ionizing radiation or any costly procedure such as MRI. These are ionizing and they can have effects on the patient. So coming to the next question. CT head demonstrates a dilated lateral and dilated lateral and third ventricle with a normal sized fourth ventricle. Which of the following would most likely account for this appearance? So here this is the lateral ventricle. This is also the lateral ventricle and we are able to see a hyperdense structure at the area of pineal, pineal gland. So this is, this is supposed to be a pineloma. Whereas the other options I will be discussing in detail. So this is the hyperdense structure which we are able to see here at the level of foramen of Monroe. This is a hyperdense structure at the foramen of Monroe which is classical for colloid cyst. This is a hyperdense structure seen at the lateral ventricle, classical at the tricone of lateral ventricle. This is choroid plexus papilloma. Next coming to, uh, so the inferior portion of, of the clivus and the post, uh, Inferior most portion of the occiput, this is the basion and this is the opistion. When a line is drawn through it, the cerebellar vermis should not come beyond 3 mm of this. If it is coming beyond 3 mm, then we call it a tonsillar herniation. Okay, the conditions for GRE type 1 is if there is tonsillar herniation and a syrinx is there. For type 2, there is a meningocele as well. And type 3, there is medullary herniation. In type 4, there is brainstem herniation. That means, the uh, med, this is the pons, midbrain, pons and medulla. So, the, if there is medulla is involved, it is type 3. And if the entire brainstem is involved, then it is type 4. So, in this, axial MRI sections, we are able to see that this is the normal vermis which is not going beyond the Macarius line that is the line drawn from the basion to opistion. Here there is a small uh, herniation of the cerebellar vermis. So it is a case of tonsillar herniation if it is more than 3 mm. The earliest radiological sign of pulmonary venous hypertension in chest x-ray is a cephalization of pulmonary vascularity B. Pleural effusion, C. Curly B lines, D. Alveolar pulmonary edema. So, what happens on the day 1? There are no significant lung changes on the day 1. Whereas on the day 4, we will be able to see patchy, ill-defined bilateral alveolar consolidates with a peripheral distribution more, mostly. So, on the day 5, there will be consolidations forming that is ill-defined, patchy, hazy opacities in the peripheral zones. On day 7, there will be typical findings of ARDS. That is, there is fibrotic bands, curly A lines, curly B lines. Curly A lines are from the hilum extending outside, whereas curly B lines are 
discontinuous short lines from the pleura which are seen as a result of interstitial edema so the what is the first and foremost uh, radiological sign that is cephalization of pulmonary vascularity the normal vascularity should be more in the lower third of the uh, on the lower third and there it should be less on this side on the upper cephal cephalic side if it is equal in cephalic as well as in caudal place then we have to suspect pulmonary venous hypertension also uh, the periphery what we have talked about in that place this is the uh, medial two third there will be normal vasculature if we are able to see more uh, vasculature even in the peripheral one third of the x-ray then also we are supposed to think of any pathology that is mostly pulmonary venous hypertension so identify the line this is an easy one the, the line is moving from the lesser trochanter to the neck and on to the ischium so this is shenton's line let us have a look at the other uh, lines also as well sorry yeah so this is the anterior acetabular line and this is the posterior acetabular line and uh, here we are able to see the acetabular roof this is the iliopectineal line and this is the teardrop why teardrop is important because the distance between the teardrop and the head of the humerus if it is greater than 3 mm then we are supposed to uh, look for the fat planes if they are elevated or not if the fat planes are also elevated then we have to think about effusion which is common in septic arthritis or any uh, hip condition which is ha having effusion um, coming to the 14th question 70 year old female recent surgery presents with shortness of breath and phreatic chest pain on examination there is slight swelling on the right leg compared to the left the DMR level is raised so which imaging investigation should be performed see there are signs for pulmonary embolism even on the chest x-ray and pulmonary angiogram as well as if we do an ultrasound bilateral lower leg veins we can rule out dvt as um, there is also there is we have already the evidence of d-dimer level is raised here in this patient and the female is uh, she is a 70 year old female that means she is already at high risk and she is a high risk patient so the next important step to, is to confirm the diagnosis and go for further imp, for, further um, management so to confirm it is better to go for ctpa but for us uh, it is important to look look for even in the chest x-ray so what are all the findings that we see in chest x-ray these are pulmonary opacities of any size and shape uh, they can be rarely lobar or segmental there is a wedge shaped opacity and there will be horizontal lines and obviously there will be pleural effusion because of this pulmonary embolism there will be oligemia that means there will be less uh, vascularity in that area of the lung field and that pulmonary artery which is blocked will be enlarged because of all of this because there is an infarct in this area there can be elevated hemidiaphragm as well so let us see on the chest x-ray so Fleshner sign is prominent central pulmonary artery which is seen in pulmonary hypertension as well as pulmonary edema. Hampton's hump, as we have discussed, it is a wedge shaped radio opacity which is seen peripherally, which is characteristic for pulmonary embolism. And Westermark sign is oligemia of the lung fields, as we have discussed. Knuckle and uh, uh, Chang sign are similar, that is, there is abrupt tapering. See the descending pulmonary artery, we are able to see till here. There is abrupt tapering here. So, this is abrupt tapering here. That is uh, abrupt tapering or cut off of the pulmonary artery due to secondary to pulmonary embolus is knuckle or chang sign and uh, pala sign is uh, enlarged descending part and there is pleural effusion here that is the meniscus sign is saying there is blunting of costophrenic angles as we have discussed already. So 10 year old uh, 15th and the last question 10 year old present with increasing dyspnea on exertion. On chest x-ray, there is dilatation of left pulmonary artery with neural calcification. Right pulmonary artery and lungs are normal. On ECG, there is right ventricular hypertrophy. So, what are all the findings we have here? Right ventricular hypertrophy and there is left pulmonary artery with neural calcification. There is dilatation of left pulmonary artery and right ventricular hypertrophy. So, first let's go to the uh, flow chart. If there is cyanosis, we have to 
see if there is cyanosis if it is yes then we have to go for the increased if it is a cyanotic heart disease and the vascularity is increased we have to think about the five t's that is transposition of great arteries truncus arteriosus tapvc trans tricuspid atresia and tingle ventricle if the vascularity is decreased then we have to look for cardiac enlargement how will we look for cardiac enlargement in a chest x ray so we will we will see the intercardiophrenic from costophrenic angle to the costophrenic angle we will measure it and through the heart largest measure of the heart border if it is greater than 50% then it is cardiomegaly that means if the heart border is around 15 cm and this is 30 then it is exactly at 50% if it is more if it is 20 and 30 it is definitely more than 50% that means there is cardiomegaly so the vascularity is decreased and there is cardiac enlargement then we have to think about abstains and tricuspid atresia and most importantly our answer pulmonary atresia so cardiac enlargement is not there then we have to think about tetralogy of fallot what are the five things uh, four things in tetralogy of fallot right ventricular hypertrophy pulmonic stenosis overriding of the arch of aorta and vsd if tof is there along with asd then we have to call it as pentology of fallot okay fine next coming to the acyanotic heart disease if there is vascularity if the vascularity is increased and there is left atrial enlargement then we have to see if the aorta is enlarged or not if the left atrium is enlarged and the aorta is also enlarged then we have to think about pda what is pda the pulmonary artery has a communication with the arch of aorta during the fetal life that is ductus arteriosus after the birth immediately this the flow is from pulmonary artery to the aorta why is the flow from pulmonary artery to the aorta because the lungs are non functional in the fetal life they don't need anything like there is no there is increased resistance in the pulmonary artery arterial vasculature than the systemic uh, vasculature so the flow is from the pulmonary artery through the ductus arteriosus into the aorta so after the fetal life uh, after the fetal life is ended and after the birth there will be enlargement of the lungs and there will be decrease in the pulmonary resistance and the flow will be inside the pulmonary artery only if this is patent if the if the uh, ductus arteriosus is still patent depending on if it is pre ductal ductal or post ductal there is a lot of conditions there so the most important thing to remember in patent ductus arteriosus is there is enlarged aorta which we can be seeing on the chest x ray there will be enlarged aorta and there will be uh, left atrium also is enlarged we have already discussed about the heart border so the left atrium will be enlarged and aorta will be enlarged in pda if the aorta is not enlarged and left atrium only is en uh, enlarged then we have to think of vst um when the pulmonary uh, vascularity is normal then it is aortic stenosis pulmonic stenosis can even present as a cyanotic or a acyanotic depending um uh, and depending on the severity and coarctation of aorta vascularity is normal so here uh, let us see so our answer is there is dilatation of right palm uh, uh, left pulmonary artery with mural calcification and right pulmonary artery and lungs are normal lungs are normal that means the vascularity is normal vascularity is normal there is right uh, ventricle hypertrophy so the answer is pulmonary stenosis let us look at the imaging findings also so here we are able to see there is an enlarged uh, pulmonary artery there is hilar enlargement this is a aneurysm of pulmonary artery if there there can also be calcifications present then it is called as eisenmenger's reaction uh, next coming to this x ray we, we are able to see that there is increased cardiac chamber enlargement is there so there is cardiomegaly our first finding is cardiomegaly and there is obscuration of the aorta pulmonary window 
and there is increased vascularity also. So this is a case of patent ductus arteriosus. This is a diagrammatic representation. This is how we measure on the console. So this is measuring approximately 9.8 centimeters and this is 19. So this is a normal chest x-ray with no cardiomegaly. Coming to this x-ray, so uh, we are able to see that there is right ventricular enlargement. This is the right ventricle border and there is right atrial enlargement. Uh, there is prominent pulmonary trunk, the hyla is uh, not very easily visible. There is vascular fullness on the left side and there is left pulmonary artery enlargement also. Here we are able to see the left pulmonary artery is also enlarged. So this is a, ca a case of pulmonic stenosis. Also uh, other uh, important clinical points for TOF, uh, there is boot shaped heart. And uh, for uh, if there is left ventricular hypertrophy, the apex will be moved outwards. And if it is right ventricular hypertrophy, the apex will be pulled upwards. In the sense, if there is left ventricular hypertrophy, the entire thing will shift like this. Whereas if it is right ventricular hypertrophy, because it is coming like this, the apex will be pulled upwards. Other uh, clinical points for a chest x-ray in congenital heart diseases. I think I've covered most of it uh, and I'm running short of time. Yes. Uh, so, thank you for your patience listening and make sure you also attend the uh, other session which is of more clinical questions just like in the next exam. Um, so, we are providing in Medicos community. Uh, the other session is on 18th February, 8.45 p.m. See you all there.